we started this series on polycystic ovarian syndrome that's pcos we started on the awareness the causes the symptoms and today we're going to be narrowing down on how you can actually self-diagnose yourself how you can narrow the symptoms you're feeling or you're experiencing to if you're dealing with pcos amongst every other thing or not we're going to really streamline that today and also i'm going to be discussing some of the treatments you know that you can use to get a grip on it so um if you missed the last communication that we had the last episode that we had on this series please um the admin is going to place on the comment section how you can watch a replay of last week and also we'll be sharing the replay link for the last episode of the this pcos series because we're taking it in batches and it's important that you know where we're coming from so you don't miss you know critical details yeah awesome so um we'll be sharing those links on the on the comment section so this show shows up every tuesday every tuesday 1 p.m we are your fetal tribe okay so quickly right now before i click the accelerator button calling your your family your friends everyone that you know that is a newlywed about to wed you know that needs information about how they are living needs to be in this show we're discussing um information that will really give you the light bulb moments i'm telling you and heart to heart and you can ask questions yeah and um we'll be addressing them so so um basically pcos can be expressed in women f with various um distinct symptoms from ss endogenic hormones like um, testosterone if we're looking at your blood scans and we're seeing a spike in your testosterone level um, some produce acne and hair growth you know on places where there are male pattern places where only men produce hair on those parts of the bed maybe they have on their bears on their chin on their stomach on their hair on their hair have hair on their legs you know or they are dealing with abdomen abdominal weight gain yeah they are only gaining weight on the waist not on the waist on the middle section on the abdomen yeah they are losing weight everywhere else but those places are difficult to wait and we're not talking about postpartum weight we're talking about weights that are difficult to lose at these particular sections of the body and loss of ovulation and menstrual cycle is another distinct um, future that we look out for when we have signs of pcos so pcos requires three criteria generally what are these three criteria one of them is delayed ovulation or periods no no if um, the doctors um, would diagnose it as olingo ovulation yeah these are delayed ovulation or missed periods the second um, criteria is excess androgen androgens are the male hormones these are the testosterone these are your dheas and when the these uh, androgens are in excess you see hormonal acne you know acne that are there are not normal they are not puberty acne okay we see male pattern hair loss you know fragile hair you know feeble hairs brittle hairs high androgen levels on the woman's blood work another distinct criteria is other conditions that will create you know similar syndromes when we have excluded other conditions that could create this syndrome where they are all excluded and this you know these syndromes that we're listing persist then this is the third criteria for pcos but recently in 20, 2003 you know there was a, re a meeting in rotterdam in um netherland it was sponsored by two of the um, top reproductive medicine group um one european and one american the european is e s h e r yes and the american is the a s r m so these two teams together and they are leading experts they gathered in this northern you know city to focus on creating a definition for, for pcos because there has been some controversies about it so the meeting produced what we call the rotterdam criteria and that's what i use in my practice with my medical practitioners for diagnosis of pcos and this has been commonly agreed arguably the most widely accepted criteria for medical diagnosis of pcos so what this meeting produced was something else that caused quite a stir in the world of endocrinology which you know made the rotterdam you know criteria different in 
diagnosing PCOS. It was that women did not need to have all those three criteria I mentioned earlier. So the rest of them criteria says that only two of the three were required for a diagnosis for PCOS. So this gave birth to the idea of a different, for, of different, um, they call it phenotypes of PCOS types. And this also produced two totally new types of PCOS, which did not exist before 2003. So the three criteria produced by this Rotterdam consensus was one, delayed ovulation. So th they agreed on that one. They agreed that delayed ovulation or delayed menstrual cycle, which is also known medically as anovulation, is one criteria that has been agreed. The second one is hyperandrogenism. This is high androgenic hormones like testosterone, like the male hormones like men I mentioned earlier. Then the third criteria is polycystic ovaries that are found in the um, ultrasound of the woman's blood work. So if you're joining us right now, comment where you're joining from. I would like to meet you. Hashtag first timer. If you're watching our baby doll show for the first time, I'll be in the comment section to meet with you. Do ensure to stick around because at the end of this broadcast, I'm going to be sharing with you my favorite tried and proven tip on eight steps to overcome PCOS. So hang around, don't go anywhere. So it's important to understand that PCOS is a very complex disorder. And that's why a lot of, unfortunately, conventional uh, medical doctors shy away from it. They give every other diagnosis, but when it comes to PCOS, they can either label it unexplainable infertility or they refer you somewhere else because it's quite complex. And you know, and these types are mainly a holding place for what we, you know, understand as of now. So this, um, the types of PCOS that we're going to be discussing, they likely change, you know, over time. And what I'm sharing with you is the most commonly accepted, you know, um, phenotypes for PCOS. So for a woman to be diagnosed with PCOS, she must exhibit two of the three required criteria, which is an ovulation, like I mentioned, um, a delay in menses or ovulation, um, hyper um, spikes in the male hormones and polycystic ovaries. Okay, so let's take a moment to explore each of these criteria because it's important, it's important that you understand it. You know, what we are doing in this show is to equip you with the information you require to help your, you know, help yourself in terms of self care and also help your conventional medical practitioner to give critical information that he or she will help to work with you better. Yeah. So an ovulation, which translates to lack of ovulation in medical terms, can also mean ovulations that are delayed past the typical timing. Yeah. So, so the the um, the average length of a woman's menstrual cycle, give or take, is twenty eight days. Yeah. So one day of the cycle is the first day of the period, and most women would ovulate around day fourteen, give or take. Yeah. An ovulation is technically defined as fewer than 10 menstrual cycles per year. So this will equal to having uh, menstrual cycles 35 days or longer in length. Do you get it? So an ovulation is typically what we just decide. If it's fewer than 10 menstrual cycles in a year, or the cycles are 35 days longer or long. As you can see, if you have um regular menstrual cycles but they are longer than average you may still have an ovulation that's missing ovulation this is something that i often see you know when we engage couples in um, our one-on-one -on -one coaching you know fertility coaching programs we see longer than average cycles though they may appear regular <laughs> do you get but they are longer than average cycles so many women actually believe that this is a normal thing but it's definitely not normal cycles that are you know 35 days in length or longer even if they are regular is a red flag for pcos particularly if that woman's cycle you know has been longer since her teenage day years so oftentimes we'll ask you how long it's been and if you see that just after puberty those are your symptoms I mean, because as women age their cycles often naturally become shorter so an ovulation may be resolved by mother nature you know as a woman matures in age so that said, if a woman had long cycles for many years when she was young, as well as other characteristics of PCOS, is a sign, you know, that she may be assessed more closely for, you know, other symptoms of PCOS. 
So another symptom number two is hypoandrogenism. This is a very long word. <laughs> that typically means there are high levels of testes the male hormones. These are the testosterone, your DHEA, you know, your andro um, genes, your, your male hormones. These particular hormones are responsible for causing male sexual characteristics like growth of facial hair or body hair or hair loss at specific you know part in specific patterns and some of the symptoms are hair growth on the chin like i mentioned on your upper lip you know around your nipple hair around your nipple or on the chest okay or on the stomach or on the upper arm so people have it on their upper arm or their upper thighs you know or in any other areas those are symptoms of high levels of the male hormone and are one of the criteria for pcos then acne particularly along the jawline or on the back if the woman has jawline acne yeah and on her back okay mostly from moderate to severe rate of acne hormonal acne this is another symptom you know to look out for hair loss in an androgenic pattern like um frontal with hairline you know that are either scattered or put together it doesn't matter there are elevated hormones that are showing up there like so we ask for the blood works and we're looking out for elevated spikes in testosterone and dheas yeah so from my point of view the rotodem you know phenotypes are simply a compilation of you know some of the factors of pcos that we need to know in order to treat the disorder and really not specific enough to form a treatment guideline so there's no um copy or paste you know and that's why i work with medical practitioners that have the best interest of the the people that are working with our heart so there's no pcos treatments copy and paste there are a lot of things that we we'll need to you know look at and look at in the diagnosis to be sure that okay this is what is specifically recommended for this person for the purpose of treatment I'll be teaching you to identify your own unique factors, giving you, you know, the most customized treatment program that you can use. Yeah. So if you're joining for the first time, hashtag first timer. If you're watching a red broadcast, hashtag red broadcast. This is Chica Samuels, your fertility coach. And we're talking everything about polycystic ovarian syndrome, one of the most notorious and popular endocrine disruptors that we see, you know, um, in um, female infertility. Okay, so I, I believe, like I mentioned, that the rotodent phenotypes are important to know. It's important that you know it. You know, it helps you determine the, you know, first, if you even have PCOS in the first place. Then if you do, it helps you to understand about the intensity of your PCOS. Where are you at the moment? You know, so women need to have two, two of the three criteria that I've mentioned before. And this leaves us with four unique types of the rotodent phenotypes. So type A and type B are basically classic types of PCOS that, you know, and also as defined as, you know, in NIH. The type C and the type, type D, however, are non-classic, okay? So let's look at them in detail. So the type 1, in the type 1 category, you're seeing the delayed ovulation playing. You're seeing hyperandrogenic features, like I mentioned, hair on the jaw, they have hair on the upper, they have hair around their nipples, and you will see polycystic ovaries on their ultrasound. This is type A phenotype. Then the type B, you will see delayed ovulation in the category that I've mentioned previously. You know, even if the menses is regular, you, I have explained to you how to track delayed ovulation, yeah? So in type B, you're finding delayed ovulation, you're finding those hyperandrogenic features, and you're finding normal ovaries, you know, in the ultrasound. So you may not see polycystic ovaries in the ultrasound. This is type B. Then the type C is that you're seeing those features, those male pattern features with polycystic ovaries in the ultrasound scan that they present and also with regular ovulation. Are you seeing? Very, very tricky. <laughs> very tricky. Then the type D is delayed ovulation. You will see polycystic ovaries on their ultrasound, but they don't have this androgenic sign. So they don't see, you don't see them with the hairs. And all that but when they present their blood scan you see the polycystic you know ovaries yeah on the ultrasound so a diagnosis of exclusion is what we really use to diagnose pcos because there is no um blood test that is tagged pcos test <laughs> we have explained that in our previous episodes of this series yeah 
So therefore, other disorders could cause these symptoms, but we need to, you know, we, we use that resident checklist to check it all out, to rule out the probability and likelihood of those, you know, diagnoses before we tag someone PCOS. So other, you know, organizations strongly disagree with these types, especially the type D, the non-endogenic phenotype. But an, an important um, international organization called the Androgen Excess and PCOS Society have concluded, and I agree with them, and this has been my experience in my you know, years of practice, by definition that PCOS must meet certain criteria. They must meet the criteria of excess androgen. That's why we is, you know, insist to ask for the blood works. We must see the excess androgens in the scan result in the in the blood work. So it's also possible that type D is simply a very mild, maybe it's just developing a mild um, PCOS phenotype. Yeah, I didn't get to show you what I'm eating today. I have avocados here. You know, it's our culture. Who loves to eat avocado like this? I like eating it, so it's easy to. So I don't miss out anything, and I have my cup of water. So cool. If you're just joining in and you're seeing me eating, I eat a lot, but I eat good food. <laughs> All right. So um, we're talking about PCOS and how to determine your PCOS type. Yeah. So to make it simple, you first need to determine which of the criteria that you have. Yeah. I'm sure the things I'm discussing, you may know someone that has these features. If you don't know if you have any of the criteria, it's okay. Take a deep breath. Just follow me through. You'll be able to self-diagnose yourself. Okay, so there are some typical questions you need to ask yourself. For hypoandrogenism, you need to ask yourself typically two questions. You need to ask yourself, do I have significant acne, hair growth on your chin, upper lip, stomach, upper thigh, upper arms, at your back, and noticeably hair loss that is either diffuse or behind the front hairline that is not explained by any other factor. You can't explain it by iron deficiency or any other factor yeah that's the first question the second question is have i been tested for testosterone dhea these are these male hormones okay and are the numbers elevated these are the two questions you can use to diagnose for the male hormone spikes then for the lack of ovulation the first question is there are two questions you could ask uh, yes two questions the first question is are my menstrual cycles irregular or usually 35 days longer or long you get it the second question is do i experience difficulty in ovulation if you need help on how to track your ovulation we have done a an exhaustive complete webinar on um and it's a paid webinar you just pay a token of five is it five thousand or fifteen thousand my admin will let you know okay on the comment session is a paid webinar you pay and we took time to explain the three way the so precious three way tool on how to track your ovulation properly because a lot of times the problem is not that you have fibroid PCOS the problem is that you are ovulating but you're not having intentional sex at the times you are ovulating so you probably don't know when you are ovulating because the fertility window is so so narrow even with PCOS as we have discussed there could be difficulty in ovulation, but you could be ovulating, but you need to track properly and know when it's happening so that your sex efforts are intentional and deliberate. You get, because when you're trying for a child, you don't have all the time in the world to be having sex every day. So <laughs> you need to be sure that you are having at the right time, yeah? So that webinar is a very important tool. So if you'd like to have um, a copy of the webinar, we're going to share with you a link to your email so that you can um, replay it and you know arm yourself with those tools to effectively track your ovulation okay so i'm going to share that on the comment session so do you experience difficulty in ovulation these are the two questions for tracking an ovulation then the third um, symptom is polycystic ovaries so the first question you should ask is um does your scan show that you have small um, multiple it comes in colonies you know like pearls yeah so does it show that you have multiple small follicles more than 26 in number on your ovaries when you look at your you know ultrasound you can you know ask your medical practitioner or if you're in a coaching program these are the things that we look out for 
you know, to know if you belong to the cystic, you know, phenotype that we talked about, you have to probably visit a doctor to have an, an ultrasound if you don't have one, you know, so that because there's so many women that, you know, they don't know if they have ovarian cysts. Okay, so if you have one of the other two criteria and you suspect that you have PCOS, you should request for an ultrasound. Even if your doctor is telling you you don't need one, <laughs> please request for one and let us have a look at it, yeah? So remember that older women, you know, who may have this factor in the past can outgrow this as a number of number of eggs. You know, the number of eggs that the woman produces decreases with maturity. Okay, so research now believe that when girls go through puberty, in puberty when, when the hormonal system temporarily enters, you know, a state that is similar to PCOS. For most women, this phases away. But for some women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, it continues. Okay, so it's thought that PCOS may be similar to the hormonal situation of puberty, not coming to its full completion, you get. So, so because of that, um, using the cystic um, criteria to diagnose PCOS in a teenage girl um, is quite controversial, you know, since many girls have ovaries with PCOS type of appearance in that age, yeah? So you can now note that which of the qualities you have, then combine them, you know, to, to determine your type of phenotype, like we have discussed, okay? So it's important to ask for your blood works if you've not done that. So let's look at some factors that influence your PCOS, your PCOS type. One of the factors is age, the other is weight, another is environment, another is genetics, and the last, but definitely not the least, is social emotions. We're going to take them a little bit one after the other. So for age, young women naturally, you know, have more follicles in their ovaries. It's natural. You're born with all the eggs that you require. So you're born with a lot. And they are more likely to be a cystic phenotype. So it's particularly the case for most teenage girls. So as women age, the number of follicles in your ovaries naturally decline. The, the newer threshold for 26 follicles don't apply to women under 18 years or over 35 years for these very reasons I've mentioned. So fortunately, another type of PCOS problem gets better with age. That's the level of the, um, the male hormones, like I talked about, you know, gets better with age. So as such, a woman may move from one type of the more severe phenotype of PCOS, such as the A type, to a more or less severe phenotype, such as the C type, as she gets older. Do you understand? So yes, hormones and reproductive problems of PCOS can actually improve, you know, as a woman gets older. That's great, right? <laughs> At least some good news. So it's important to know that the metabolic risk of PCOS, like you know, cardiovascular diseases, type 2, diabetes, actually increase with age. You must know that. So let's talk about weight and how it relates to PCOS also. PC weight is one of the, I would emphasize, I've seen it over and over again in our practice. When women come with high BMIs, which is one of the factors we look at in our coaching programs, and we ask them to hit the road and give them targeted exercises, we see ovulations come back, even before supplements. We see menstrual cycles regulate. Once they hit their hydration properly and the exercise, the right kind of exercises, because weight is a very crucial factor that determines the severity of your PCOS. Weight gain, not including that of lean muscle, of course, you know, promotes insulin resistance. And insulin resistance, I tell you, is associated most times with most classic types of the type A and the type B. And these are the, you know, the severe types of PCOS. So weight loss, particularly weight of inches at your waist, your midsection, yeah, at your waistline, often, you know, easily move a woman to a milder from a severe type of phenotype of PCOS to a milder, you know, type. So it's a very important tool to give attention to if you're dealing with PCOS. Also, on the other flip of the coin, the opposite is also true. Gaining weight, especially around your waist, can move you from the non-classic, mild negligible type of pcos as a class c you know to class a and class b so studies have shown that you know women should aim for an abdominal circumference of about 35 inches or less to achieve a mild you know version of the phenotype pcos like we discussed so in those with formal frames people that with that are in smaller frames 
you know, such as um, Southeastern Asian women, it's recommended that theirs to reduce insulin resistance should be about 32 inches or less. So let's look at how epigenetics make it play and what impact does environment also play in um, PCOS. Epigenetics mostly, I've discussed this in previous sessions of our conversations, is an expression of your DNA changes in response to anything in your environment. Do you understand? So your genetics are changeable. Your genetics are changeable. Is that not good news? Because a lot of times, and I say this a lot, a lot of times say, oh, it's in our, in, it's in our blood. We are fat in our family. Uh, we, they say they are obese in their family. Genetics are changeable. And the study of epigenetics have proven this to be true. A few genetic associations have been made, you know, associated with PCOS. And I must, this is noteworthy that animal studies have also shown that babies exposed to a high androgen environment, such as in the mother's womb, the bloodstream, during pregnancy seem to be more prone to PCOS as adults. Yes. So, and this may be why PCOS can be passed on in the family. So you that is diagnosed with PCOS has a role to play to stop this thing and not pass it on to your next generation that you're going to give birth to. So with respect to environment, if a woman is exposed to toxic um, endogenic, exo-endogenic um, products like plastics, P uh, PC, you know, phthalates in your food, in your skin products, in your personal care products, in your cooking wares, in your there's a lot, you know, that we talk about in environmental session and environmental toxin awareness in our coaching programs. And we explain a lot on how this have an impact. These exaggerate, you know, hormonal imbalances that cause PCOS and make them, move them from the mild range to the grievous range. Okay, and the tendencies of moving into the next generation. Yes. So genetics also play a role because some women are just prone to more severe phenotypes of the condition than others. You know, despite the changes that they make in their diet or lifestyle, or we see that in very rare cases. But there are more and more evidence confirming that, you know, even though it's a, it, it could be genetic disorder in some people, because of epigenetics, you can actually reverse that and move it forward from you to your generation onwards. So social, um, emotional factor. This may sound like an unusual, you know, category and be like, what does it have to do with here? But it contributes to the type of PCOS that you may fall into. It's unlikely that this alone can move you from one category to the other. But there is a good indication by research, you know, that suggests that stress, emotional health play a huge role in the severity of PCOS. Yes, your mood, your stress and how you're handling stress plays a huge role. You know, women with PCOS often have high than average cortisol levels cortisol is your stress hormone which triggers a variety of hormonal imbalances you know stress management is a very very critical it's an intangible a lot of times people take it for granted but it's something that we give attention you know to in our coaching programs in our fertility coaching programs because it plays a huge role in even influencing the phenotype of the woman's PCOS through the activities that he, she does how she manages her stress and the type of food that she eats you know, it's a very, very important um, criteria. So um, PCOS, healing PCOS or reversing PCOS is an integrative approach. It's not a cut and paste approach. So no matter what your PCOS symptoms are, you know, or which ones are categories that you fall into, you know, um, you may have been dealing with it with a typical medical conventional approach. You know, for example, you decide which symptom that you're dealing with. Okay, you pick a doctor that deals with that part of the body. And maybe if you say an uh, irregular menstrual cycle, you go to your gynecologist because she knows about uterus. Then if you say um, about acne, you go to your dermatologist because he or she knows about the skin. Um, if it's sleep problem or anxiety or depression, um, you go to your psychiatrist or your therapist, yeah? But the approach that we um, we produce results with in our fertility coaching programs is an integrative and holistic approach. And the people that have received results, even, you know, in other fertility approaches with dealing with PCOS uses this approach, this integrative approach. And I call it the eight way approach to reverse and overcome PCOS. So there are eight areas that you must focus on, you know, to reverse or overcome PCOS, no matter the 
the, the severity level or um, the phenotype type where you fall in. The first thing is you have to address inflammation, yeah? The second step is that you must treat insulin resistance, not by injection or by drugs, by balancing the factors that are causing the insulin to be resistant, okay? I mentioned that you must treat and address inflammation. It's very, very critical. The third step is that you have to balance your adrenals. You must balance your male hormones that are spiking, which we find very often. The fourth step is you must treat excess androgen. The fifth step is that you have to address hormonal imbalances because they are sure and hormonal imbalances. Your DHEA, your testosterone, your cortisol level, your progesterone in some cases are out of balance. We see them very frequently. These hormones must be addressed. The sixth step is that you must acknowledge and balance your thyroid level. This is one area a lot of conventional medicine doctors miss it when treating PCOS and that is where the get stuck and they label it unexplainable infertility <laughs> okay the seventh step is you must create a healthy environment I can't emphasize this enough this plays a critical role and I'm talking about your skin products your personal care products um, um, your hair products your your uh, your environment where you live where you walk how you move these are very critical. Then the eighth and one of the most important steps also is to eat a balanced diet, a balanced fertile diet. A balanced fertile diet is different from a balanced diet. There is a fertile diet that is focused on addressing PCOS, minimizing inflammation. Do you understand? Because there are some critical supplements that you should be on. There are some critical anti-inflammatory um, anti um, nutrients that should be in your food. Okay, like um, your resveratrol, your there are some particular fish oils and in some particular you know dosages that you should consume every day. You know there are some um, what's it called um, enriched foods like dark colored berries. There are some particular you know anti-inflammatory in you know enzymes that should be in your food that we should be targeting your bloodstream with. Okay, to balance the autoimmunity and also the the hormones that are out of balance okay so and uh, it this is the reason why the so precious coaching programs came in place because there is just so much we can discuss in barely 30 minutes to one hour of a weekly show so if you're struggling with any of the symptoms we have mentioned take advantage of the early bed of our quarter two coaching fertility coaching program is kicking off on april 27th 2020 2021 let me tell you, we had to refund payments to over 25 couples that enrolled after the closure of the first quarter group coaching program. This is because this class is only for 10. And because some people were sharing the broadcast, they, were, they kept sharing the broadcast, so the information to make payments were there. And people credited their accounts, even when we had maxed the class. So we had to reach these people and refund back their monies. The seat is only for 10 couples. It's open for 10 individuals or 10 couples from all around the world. It's a virtual session and it's, I, I can't explain it enough, but I can tell you that this is one of our premium services and where um, most of our testimonials, you know, for people that are trying for children or dealing with infertility issues come from. It's quite an engaging, there is so much to learn. And each and this, eight areas that I discussed about in targeting and overcoming PCOS and many other factors because you may not be dis dealing with PCOS but you've been trying for a child longer than two years this quarter two group coaching fertility program is for you I encourage you to take advantage of the 10% early discount that is ending by close of business April 27th okay the program sorry starts on 1st of May to um, 1st of May 2021 yeah but the early bird discount closes on 27th of April 2021 and once it's close of business instead of being able to pay 9,000 naira which is a 10% discount you have to pay 100,000 naira trust me over and over again in our feedback you know that we get from those that have graduated from this group coaching program we keep hearing that 
the value that they got is where it outweighs how much that they paid because the medical practitioners that we're working with would show more light you understand your diagnosis in ways that you never thought possible in ways your conventional doctor had never explained to you i encourage you to take advantage of it we only have 10 seats available once we max the seat of 10 we close um, taking entries for the quarter is a quarterly program and if you miss this quarter too you have to wait for when this will open for quarter three and i can tell you that um, quarter three does not mean that it's going to be the first <laughs> month of the third quarter because our calendar program for the year is maxed back to back so i encourage you to take advantage of it the um, admin has posted on the group um, the comment section on how you can enroll if you like this video, share your thoughts on what values you got. If you have questions, I'll be coming to the comment section to address them afterwards. If you're watching by live, hashtag live and first timer, hashtag first timer or read broadcast, please hashtag read broadcast and let me know where you're joining from. I'll be coming to the comment section to engage with you and to answer your questions. I hope you learned something today and I hope to see you in the fertility group coaching program where we'll be throwing more light not just on the diagnosis but holding you hand to hand you know from baby to beyond to overcome infertility to postpartum i look forward to engaging with you till we meet next time keep living healthy and keep giving the world your best